Hi, I'm Jay Edidin. And I'm Miles Stokes. And we're the hosts of Jay and Miles Explain the X-Men, a weekly podcast all about the ins, the outs, and the retcons of comics' greatest superhero soap opera. We're also the hosts of Jay and Miles Review the X-Men. Which you're watching right now. Where we talk about the X-Books that come out each week. This week we've got the books of November 16th, 2016. Let's do this. First up is Old Man Logan number 13, written by Jeff Lemire, with art by Andrea Sorrentino, and colors by Marcello Maiolo. This is part five of The Last Ronin, which uh, brings it to about three parts longer than I feel like it really needs to be. I, I would agree, yeah. This is a solid concept. It's interesting, but it just feels so drawn out. It's, it's also kind of the same story we've been seeing since this series started. The future isn't set in stone, even though you come from the future, but it's still going to come confront you. Again... Well, and again, and again, and wait, this time it's going to do it in Japan. <laughs> so I don't, I don't disagree, but I do want to say I like that as a story. I think it's worked. I think it's fit the tone of Old Man Logan as a mm-hmm. book, but I think it's also time to do something new. I mean, yeah, this storyline does that to a degree. Like he's clearly learned from his mistakes and he uses that knowledge to best people who have not learned those lessons, I guess, because they haven't traveled through time. Uh, yeah, that'll do it. Our Leapt Between Universes. I wonder if the cat's going to be audible on this video. Uh, we're very proud to ple- to report that our cat is um, greatly, wonderfully, murderously killing a felt mouse uh, behind the computer. She's exceptionally fierce. Exceptionally. That she, felt later mouse on, doesn't... she's going to leave it outside the bedroom door and squawk really loudly till we praise her. Mm-hmm. It's true. Same uh, thing. Now I'm just imagining old man Logan doing that. You know, it's really easy to picture. It surprisingly is, yeah. Yeah. Except it would be like, you know, a, the severed head of an archer or something. I'd read that comic. Yeah, yeah, me too. Anyway, I like Sorrentino on this. This is a quieter issue. It's a more dialogue-heavy issue, more feelings-y issue, and that seems to be the place where he really shines, at least for me. Mm-hmm. Um, I wish, honestly, that this arc had been more in that direction and much, much, much shorter, the action-y parts of it, other than the climbing out of the well, which was honestly like a page and a half. Um, just felt like padding. Yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, Sorrentino does, you know, sprays of blood and stuff really well. Yeah, they're very but stylish. Yeah, but it's not the dynamism you see with, with some artists, as much as I certainly love Sorrentino also. Mm-hmm. So as far as the Maureen parts, as far as the segments that were set in Logan's past, our future, what'd you think about those? I mean, I thought they were okay. (laughs) See, for me, that was the strongest part of the issue. Like, I haven't always liked those flash-forward flashback things, Mm -hmm. but seeing how Maureen, Logan's wife in the future, reacts, you know, after learning who he is, learning about, you know, the claws and the murder, and them deciding to sort of carve out a little bit of the f- of the future they can protect for themselves, for each other, for their child. Like, I don't know, that works for me. Seeing that softness in Wolverine that he's lost, I dig. You know, if I were writing this, I would have played more visual, even just visually, um, with building a parallel on the layout of those panels to the ones with Lady, Lady Deathstrike. Interesting. I don't see Deathstrike and Maureen as at all parallel they're in Logan's not, life. They're not remotely equivalent roles, but the fact that he's there confronting her. I mean, what we've seen a lot is, well, the, you're, you have better alternatives now. You have better options now. Mm-hmm. And this instead is a scene of pretty palpable loss. You know, he's, he's giving someone else the options that he had, but he's also saying goodbye to maybe the one good thing about his past. Okay. Okay, I'll buy that, yeah. And Lady Deathstrike as the really, really crappy consolation parallel. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, as someone who, on one hand, totally sees and accepts what he is, but on the other hand, is endlessly... (coughs) is is endlessly trying to kill him for it, would have, I think... Yeah, I think that would have been an interesting narrative hook. I'd like to see more done with the people around Logan, because... Mm -hmm. Logan's been the focus, and so again, we've been seeing the same arc basically repeating, and I think I think there are other directions and other branches that could have taken us in more interesting directions. Yeah, honestly, um, uh, but whether it's Deathstrike or somebody else, a solid supporting cast for this book, a consistent supporting cast, I think could really, really help. Next up is All New Wolverine number 14, written by Tom Taylor with pencils by Nick Varela, inks by Scott Hanna, and colors by Michael Garland and Jesus Abertov. And uh, I, I'm pretty sure that Bella helps too. Hi, Bella. Bella never helps. She is the worst assistant of all time. You know, with two Wolverine books this week... It's Claw Week. It's Claw Week, but it's really hard not to compare them. And man, Old Man Logan does not come out looking comparatively all that good. Yeah, I would agree. We were talking about this earlier. And for me, a lot of what Old Man Logan is missing right now is 
variety is having different events, different types of plots, different genres even, to show us different sides of our lead character. And All-New Wolverine has consistently done that really, really well. I mean, we saw that going from, like, you know, science to magic to weirdness of various sorts. God, this cat, cat is very demanding. Yeah, this is this is the downside to recording on the couch. Downside. Yes. Uh, but yeah, and now we're seeing something that we knew would have to come at some point. The bad stuff. Mm. Now, okay, so I just mainlined, like, the entire X-23 series and the two miniseries that led up to it in the last couple of weeks. Oh, interesting. Yeah, and so seeing Enemy of the State 2, which ostensibly is a sequel to the old Wolverine story where he was taken over by the Hand, etc., etc., really what this is, though, is a follow-up to all of the really dark stuff from Laura's past, because All New Wolverine has been a pretty lighthearted book by comparison. Was I right about Marjorie Lou's Gambit? Marjorie Lou writes the best Gambit! Right? Like, suddenly I love Gambit after reading yeah. him in X-23. Now I really want to read her run in Astonishing X-Men, which I also Because Gambit read. is a character who fundamentally works best when he's been being written from the perspective of and for a female gaze. Uh, yeah, yeah, I would completely agree. Also, he's, like, way less sleazy in the X-23 series. But he's also consistent. True, yeah. And well-written. Anyway, really good book. You should all go read it. Yeah, it's actually freaking great. So are the miniseries that lead up to it. Recommend them all. Speaking of really good books, All New Wolverine. Right. So, and so here what we see is two of the kind of unresolved plot threads from the worst parts of Laura's past coming back to haunt her. We have the trigger scent, which mm -hmm. has been out there, you know, since she was a child being raised as, you know, an emotionless killer, which is a scent that makes her go into a berserker rage and kill everybody when she's exposed to it. And we have Kimura, her old handler from when she was being raised as a weapon, who is still out there and we saw early on in the series as well. And so seeing those plot lines finally hitting home with Laura, it's rough because especially having read more X-23 recently, we know what this means. So... This is also a place where I feel like the series is not exactly coming to a head, but most of the arcs that we've seen have been either really intense and serious or somewhat lighthearted. Mm -hmm. This one is both at once. We've got, I mean, this is a this is a dark arc, and this is a horrifying arc, and this is a scary arc, and it's a high stakes arc. And it's still silly, and it's still fun, and... Right now, those things feed into the feeling of high stakes because they're part of what's at risk, but they also keep the book from being bogged down by its own intensity. You're referring to the stuff with Gabby, for instance? And the pelican statue. Yeah, so like yeah. sort of Laura's home life. And the punching on the helicarrier. And, well, and that's, yeah. some, that's something that's different this time around is mm -hmm. that Laura has much more to lose these days than she usually has in the past. I mean, there have been other yeah. times like with the NYX kids and the X-Men and stuff like that. But she also but... has people she feels responsible for in right. ways that she didn't before. Not just people who have taken her in and taken care of her, but someone to whom she has that relationship. And I mean, she and Gabby are establishing something much closer to the relationship that Wolverine had with the, with the, the kids he mentored. Uh, yeah, I would agree, and I'm so glad Gabby didn't die that time she got, you know, stabbed a bunch of old man yet, Logan. Yeah, I keep on thinking yet about Gabby not dying. Well, yeah. But again, Old Man Logan, mm -hmm. we talked about needing a, a recurring um, sort of sidecast. X-23 mm -hmm. has that largely in the form of Gabby, and Jonathan, I guess, also, the Wolverine. But Gabby's a strong enough character to make that totally work. So yeah. I'm, I'm curious where this is going to go. I mean... We know probably nowhere good, but this isn't as dark as the X-23 standalone was, and it certainly isn't as dark as her uh, introductory miniseries. I'm hoping things are going to be all right. We'll see. One thing I do really appreciate, though, is that we're not seeing the her having to convince Nick Fury and S.H.I.E.L.D. that she's not lying. We're not seeing, you know, no. Gabby, like, wanting to st wanting to come with her and Laura saying no. Like, everyone acts reasonably. Nick Fury's like, holy shit, you're totally right. And Gabby's like, no, I'm stubborn and I'm going to come with you. And that's refreshing. Yeah, you know, you said it, it, it isn't just darkness it when it's dark it's every bit as dark as those darker books it's just that it's got a wider spectrum the light bits and the dark bits offset each other so beautifully mm -hmm. and i think each feels a lot more significant for the other's presence speaking of light bits and dark bits what do you think of nick Farella's art um it's growing on me it's growing on me pretty hard i was not exactly lukewarm on her at first. I mean, her stuff was really good. It's just that she had such big shoes to fill on yeah, this title. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is, this is, is, the, the bar that she's shooting for is basically perfection. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> there's that. Um, yeah, no, her Laura is really growing on me. And I agree. And her, her range of expression is really, really good. Um, her ability to go between that and combat is really good. Yeah, she's solid. Um, I, I, I 
fully and and officially accept her as as the all new Wolverine artist now. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and uh, random good news. I nothing con- nothing is confirmed, but there was an interview I was reading with Tom Taylor. He was asked mm-hmm. about kind of what's going on in Resurrection, you yeah. know, as everything is relaunched, and he did at least imply that he's still got plans for Laura going through that. So yes! I don't know if that means he's doing Weapon X, or there are books we haven't heard of, or what. But I feel good about that because Tom Taylor yeah. and Laura Kinney are an excellent, excellent match. Yes. Finally, it's annual time. We've got Uncanny X-Men Annual Number 1. Another Uncanny X-Men Annual Number 1. Relaunch, relaunch. Um, featuring two stories, Balancing the Scales, written by Cullen Bunn, with art by Ken Lashley and colors by Nolan Woodard, and Lady Luck, which is written, drawn, and colored by Anthony Piper. And... I like this. This was solid. I think I liked the second story a bit better. That might be because I like Domino a lot more than I like Josh Foley. <laughs> I mean, he's fine. There's a, I have nothing against Elixir, but he's he's never really, really stuck out for me. He's never been a character I was ex- explicitly interested in on his own. I say if you're going back to that era, bring back Surge. Why is Surge right? not around? She led a, a team of X-Men for like years, and now nobody talks about her. It's and she's sad. got fantastic hair. And those cool glove things. Right. <sighs> oh, well. That was from the era, era when everyone had those huge gauntlets yeah but she had a reason for hers it kept her electricity did, yeah. from going everywhere yeah no she's a great character and i would love to see her come back um maybe in generation x that's my hope the elixir story is interesting yeah so I'm elixir died a while back in uncanny x-men as one does he got better as one does right there's there's a pretty good line about it i don't remember what but oh, where he's, no, where he's shocked that they didn't they didn't consider that he'd obviously come back bitter and shocked but that's interesting to me because one of the defining stories find this. you should keep talking while uh, i do one of the defining stories of new x-men the book that he was most central in was when reverend striker killed like 40 of his classmates and they definitely did not come back so i guess he's referring to more recent stuff or stuff <clears> before uh nothing stays dead in this world yeah he says bitterly to magneto well but I don't know. I mean, I'm glad to see him back. I like Josh Foley. Like I said, not my favorite character from the era, but he's interesting. And he kind of went out like a chump before. So, you know. Well, and it's an interesting take on him and his powers with interesting implications for the larger storyline. Yeah, I forget who it was. One of the comics news sites was talking about how this issue might have big implications mm-hmm. for how Resurrection goes. I don't oh, know if that's going to be the case. Yeah, I mean, literally. Well, you know, healing and mpox and stuff. I really liked Monet in here. Yeah, especially with Psylocke gone. Yeah, the way she's, the way she's wrestling with stepping into that role was really interesting. The sort of conscience of the team, Um, especially since she's got little demon mouths in her hands, all secret like. This book has so I I have trouble reviewing the art because this book has sort of conditioned me to respond to Ken Lashley's pencils with just intense relief. (laughs) Yes, (laughs) yes. So that. I like the colors. But yeah, no, the colors are lovely. I think the I'm art's good. actually really good. We we ended up going with a different one, but one of our picks for panel of the week was was from this issue. And uh, Lashley gets gets to do a lot more with subtle expression and nuance um, with his with, with drawing elixir, which he, mm-hmm. he handles really beautifully. Agreed. Well, and, and handles beautifully in concert with Woodard, especially, mm-hmm. I think. Um, so the second story, let me look back up. Uh, Anthony Piper's Lady Luck. Oh, man. If there was ever a character who dropped just beautifully and elegantly and perfectly into the um, sort of mi- into the Mighty Avengers situation and lineup, oh, the New Avengers, you mean? New Avengers, yes, yeah. yes, it, the one grew out of the other. I can, mm-hmm. I can keep track of titles. They're both Avengers books. All, all of my sorting power is reserved for X for books with X in the title. Legit. But um, yes, the 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 New Avengers. Um, if there was ever a character who dro- dropped sm- smoothly and beautifully tonally into that book, it was Domino. Uh, yeah, so seeing her interact with Sunspot in this, and I don't remember the last time they interacted. Like I guess it was back in the X Force days, maybe. Probably so. Um, but it's fun. Like he, it's it's a heist. Well, a murder heist, really. Uh, I mean, assassination, it be I guess. It's a, it's a, it's an assassination job. She's solid snaking her way through a, a big facility. Shooting a lot of people, and it's basically a classic domino examining her powers. Everything falls into place and happens happily, and she and Roberto are just sassy as hell at each other. Yeah, the idea of I like, and that's it. It's the great. idea of Sunspot as her handler. I've loved him yeah. as the kind of behind the scenes supreme leader of AIM and sassy Avengers. mastermind. He, I never thought he would work that well. He was always such a front liner, but he's just so like douchily smug about everything, and it's wonderful. Did you listen to Alan my uh, sofa special? I did. Yeah. Okay, so one of the things we talked about a lot that that I feel pretty strongly. And, and that I'll kind of cues in on 
when he's writing the characters that Roberto, Roberto Sunspot is all about the style. Mm-hmm. Like, if he can find a template for this looks cool to do, he'll get super into that role, and he's found a way to be the cool mastermind, and so he's he's all in. Yeah, although there's a nice little twist at the end of the story. So well, this one was just fun, and yeah, man, yeah. I miss Domino. Like, before, I think my definitive Domino was probably written by Dennis Hopeless and his run of Cable and X-Force, mm, yeah. but I gotta say this issue here, eh, was giving Hopeless a run for his money. So that's three out of three, and man... It's weirding me out how much shorter I am than you when we're sitting down. Um, I'm I'm all torso, you're all legs. Yeah, it's, this yeah. is because we're about the same height standing up. My legs are like tiny. It's like I just I have basically treads. I'm I'm bone breaker from the reverse. My legs go all the way up, like all the way. You, you remember in um Vagrant Story, uh, that old PlayStation RPG where there was those, there were those little girls in the forest and it was creepy and they had those strings, uh, like silver strings holding them up like puppets and if you looked up they just kept going forever. I'm just imagining just just legs that just and they just disappear into the clouds. Yeah, wow. It's really hard finding jeans that fit. That's horrifying. Anyway, what's our pick of the week? I got distracted. Our pick of the week <laughs> is only Wolverine. Um, it's a damn solid issue and a damn solid story. It takes Laura in cool directions. We have good art, good writing, a good mix of dark and light. It's just all around solid. I mean, it's not one of the you know one for the ages. It's no X Men one thirty seven or whatever, but it's good stuff. And a good series by good people. Good people. What's our panel? Well, every once in a while, an issue comes out and there's something that's just so obviously gunning for panel of the week. And I'm always torn about what to do at that point, whether we should just perversely be like, nope, finding a different one, or just go with it. And this week we're just going with it. And so you get this spectacular two-page spread montage um, from Old Man Logan. Look at that. That That is some pretty comic book art. Mm-hmm. I'm kind of wondering which issues those panels come from. Like, I recognize a few of them from previous issues issues of the series, and I think some of them from the Secret Wars miniseries. I'm curious if there were any from the original Old Ned Logan story. I am confident that someone on the internet is currently sourcing every single one of those issues right now, and I look forward to applauding their work, but I'm absolutely not going to do it. That's it for this week. Thanks for watching. If you like what you've seen here, but think it would be way better without our faces, couch, and cat, listen to our podcast, Jay and Miles Explain the X-Men. New episodes come out every Sunday at explainthexmen.com, also on iTunes, Stitcher, and now once again on Google, on Google Play. Mm-hmm. Uh, as far as this episode, we have more Excalibur and more Cross Time Caper for you. Lots of John Carter of Mars pastiche, some really weird anime-inspired stuff, and good old Jamie Braddock. And the world's most disappointing Speed Racer riff. Yeah. Really? Really? Really more of a dirty pair riff. It's both. Yeah. They're both disappointing. Well. That podcast, these video reviews, and everything you can find at explainthexmen.com are brought to you by our Patreon subscribers. We are an entirely listener-supported project, and those are the folks who let us stay on the air and ad-free. If you would like to join their august ranks, you can do that at the link either above or below this video, depending on where you're watching it. In the meantime, we, and possibly but probably not our cat, will see you next week. So those little girls from Vagrant Story, they're called Quicksilvers, right? Mm Mm-hmm. I feel like there should be some kind of connection here. Now I'm just imagining Pietro Maximoff with puppet strings going up into heaven fighting Ashley Riot complete with his bare butt. <laughs>